Greetings fellow Dungeon Delvers, and welcome to Dorans and Dragons, where we work together to come up with Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition builds for your favorite League of Legends champions. Today we're building Sejuani, the Fury of the North. Sejuani was the child of an unwanted political marriage of Freljordian politics. Being the child of the tribe's war mother left a massive chip on Sejuani's shoulder, and when her mother, Kalkia, fled the tribe to continue the life she had actually wanted, Sejuani was desperate to fill that gap. Hearing that her tribe had suffered heavily with her departure, Kalkia returned, which infuriated Sejuani, who wanted to be the war mother of the Winter's Claw. She swore a sacred oath, spoilers, to raid a Noxian warship, believing that her success would garner the support of her tribe to overthrow her mother. During the attack on the ship, Sejuani freed a Druvask trapped on board and named it Bristle. He would become her lifelong companion and steed. With the raid a success, Sejuani challenged her mother for the right to lead the tribe. The Frost Priests were outraged at this and killed Kalkia before Sejuani could reach her. Sejuani became the new War Mother of the Winter's Claw and began a brutal conquest to swell her power and won't stop until she proves she is the only one worthy of ruling the Freljord. Before we get started with the build, go ahead and like the video and hit that subscribe button so you're always notified when we release our builds. We'd like to thank one of our newest Doran's Blade patrons, Chloe. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to us. Chloe chose Sejuani to build as part of the rewards for our Blade Tier patrons. Speaking of rewards for Blade Tier patrons, this month's homebrew is the Smuggler's Port, based on Bilgewater. We're releasing last month's homebrew, The Hidden City, onto DM's Guild if you're interested in seeing that. Come join us over on Patreon for just a dollar to get access to our awesome Discord community where we talk League and D&D all day long. All right, now let's get into it. Here's a quick preview of the build. For race, we're going with Variant Human. Per usual, our stats are going to be determined using the standard array. In terms of priority, we're going to go max strength and dump intelligence. Our leveling path is going to be levels 1 through 13 in Paladin, jump over to Fighter for 3 levels, then we'll finish off the build with 4 levels in Sorcerer. Sedge's passive, Fury of the North, is going to come from Armor of Agathis. Our Q, Arctic Assault, is going to come from Charge from our Fine Greater Steed. Our W, Winter's Wrath, comes from Sweeping Attack and Lunging Attack. Our E, Permafrost, will come from our Thunderous Smite and the Transmuted Spell Meta Magic, converting that Thunder Damage to Cold Damage. And finally, we get our Ultimate Glacial Prison from Casting Hold Person at a high enough level to target multiple creatures. For race, we're going with Variant Human, which gives us a lot of choices in crafting Sejuani. We're going to pick up a point each in our Strength and Charisma. We'll choose Animal Handling as our skill proficiency. And finally, we get a free feat, which is the whole point of picking this race, honestly. For Bristle, we're going to pick up Mounted Combatant. This is going to give us advantage anytime we attack unmounted creatures smaller than our mount. It'll also let us redirect attacks from Bristle onto us, since we're going to be a little bit tankier. Finally, this gives Bristle the Evasion ability, essentially, since any effect with a Dexterity saving throw will only do half damage if it fails, and none if it succeeds. For background, we're going with Soldier. This was a toss-up for us between Outlander and Soldier. We settled on Soldier because of her combat focus and her strong desire for conquest. Soldier's going to give us skill proficiencies with Athletics and Intimidation and the Military Rank feature. Basically, when you walk in any Winter's Claw encampment, you can walk in and commandeer equipment or stay in rest without fear. As usual, stats will be derived from the Standard Array. We're going to max Strength because she's buff AF and can just knock your block off with her flail. Constitution is our next highest stat because Iceborne Frail Yordian, duh. Prism after that for her leadership skills and straight up intimidation. Dexterity is going to be our last stat above average as a reflection of her combat reflexes. Our average stat is going to be Wisdom, and then we'll dump Intelligence. For equipment, we're going with Half Plate for Sejuani's set of armor, and of course we'll pick up a flail for her trusty weapon. Alrighty, we're going to kick things off with a level in Paladin. Paladins have a d10 hit die and give us proficiencies with all weapons, armors, and shields. We'll also pick up skill proficiencies and insight and persuasion. Divine Sense isn't super relevant to Sejuani, but Lay on Hands will be nice. It's a pool of hit points that you can dole out as an action until the pool runs out. Second level Paladins learn their fighting style. Since we're just using our flail, we'll take dueling to pick up an extra 2 damage on each strike. We also pick up our spellcasting at this level. We're only covering the Sejuani specific spells here, but there are two at this level actually. Armor of Agathis is going to be our Fury of the North. As an action, you coat yourself in a Spectral Frost that gives you 5 temporary hit points. 
Anytime you're hit while those temporary hit points exist, the attacker is going to take 5 gold damage, which is basically like Thornmail. Thunderous Smite is our second spell we'll learn, which will be our E, Permafrost. Now right now, this is going to come in as the Thunder damage. Later on, when we get our Sorceress levels, we'll convert it to Cold damage to make it match better on a flavor level. As a bonus action, you imbue your weapon so that when it strikes, it deals an extra 2d6 thunder damage. And if the creature fails a strength save, it's knocked back 10 feet and lands prone. Now, we wouldn't be talking about paladins if we didn't mention the feature they actually use their spell slots on, Divine Smite. Whenever you hit a creature with a melee attack, you can spend a spell slot to deal 2d8 radiant damage, plus 1d8 for each level of the slot above 1. Meaning you can thunder a smite and divine smite for some serious damage. At level 3, Paladins gain Divine Health and choose their Sacred Oath. Divine Health is going to make us immune to disease, which is definitely going to help in the Frail Yard. For our Sacred Oath, there is no more appropriate option for Zedjwani than the Oath of Conquest, which she literally swore before sacking that Noxian battleship. This is going to give us access to our Oath spells. The important ones include Armor of Agathis and Hold Person. We also get our Channel Divinities at this level, which we can use once per rest. Conquering Presence is a 30-foot AoE Fear Aura that emanates from you and frightens any creature who fails a Wisdom save for one minute. You also get Guided Strike to give you a plus 10 to an attack roll, in case you're afraid your attack roll is going to miss. 4th level Paladins unlock the first ability score improvement of the build. Per the new format, we're going to knock all these out here. At 4th level Paladin, we're taking a tough feat to give us 2 HP per level in our character. For those of you without the quick math skills, this is going to be 40 free HP by level 20. That'll give us a nice little boost to our tankiness for free, basically. At Paladin 8 and 12, we'll bump our strength 2 points each, maxing it out. At Sorcerer 4, for our final level, we'll bump our constitution 2 points for another little bit of tankiness. Level 5 Paladins get extra attack, which as usual means you get to swing the flail twice per attack action now. Meaning when we get our Battlemaster abilities, we'll be able to Sweeping Attack and then Lunging Attack to finish off our W, Winter's Wrath. We'll also pick up Hold Person for our ultimate, Glacial Prison. Hopefully your DM will let you flavor this as a giant chunk of true ice and entombing someone, but if they don't, you'll at least get the intended effect of being able to pile on that target and wreck them. We're going to skip Paladin 6 and Aura of Protection to talk about Aura of Conquest at Paladin 7. This gives you a 10-foot aura that affects any creature frightened by you, reducing their speed to zero and making them take half your Paladin levels in psychic damage if it starts its turn there. We're going to skip all the way to Paladin 13 now, skipping over Aura of Courage and Improved Divine Smite to talk about Fine Greater Steed. This spell takes 10 minutes to cast and generates a spirit in the form of a loyal mount. There's a long list of creatures available, but the closest to Bristle is going to be the Rhinoceros, which also has a Charge and Gore ability. Since a Rhinoceros and Giant Boar are both CR2 monsters, and both have very similar stats, I would be surprised if your DM didn't just let you have a Giant Boar instead, but make sure you talk to them about it. Okay, now that we've gotten Bristle, we're going to move over to Fighter to learn how to swing our flail better. Fighters have a D10 hit die and give us no new proficiencies. We will get another fighting style though. We're going to take Superior Technique to give ourselves a Spear Superiority die, which we'll discuss at Fighter 3. Second Wind is going to be our final level 1 feature, which will let us heal ourselves as a bonus action for 1d10 plus our Fighter level once per rest. Remember not to forget to use this before you use any hit die on a short rest. Second level Fighters get Action Surge. As you know, I think this is one of the best features in the game, and is the reason why a lot of power builds take a 2 level dip in Fighter at the very least. This lets us perform two actions on our turn, once per rest. At level 3, fighters choose their martial archetype. We're going to learn how to swing our fell most effectively with the Battlemaster. This is going to give us a pull of 48 superiority die, actually 5 thanks to our fighting style, that we can use to empower our maneuvers. These maneuvers are special attacks that use our superiority die to enhance the damage of those strikes. The two maneuvers we're going to be using are sweeping attack and lunging attack. Sweeping Attack allows us to continue our attack to any target within 5 feet of our original target as long as the same attack roll would hit on them as well. The damage done by this strike is whatever you roll on your superiority die. Lunging Attack simply allows us to increase the range of our attack by 5 feet and add that superiority dice's roll as damage on top. 
Alrighty, now that we've gotten some flail action in our life, we need to awaken our iceborne powers with some levels in Sorcerer. Sorcerers have a d6 hit die, yuck, and give us no new proficiencies. For our Sorceress origin, we're going with Divine Soul. We wanted to go Storm Sorcery, that's a little more lightning and windy than snowy and icy, which we were hoping for. This gives us Favored by the Gods feature and Divine Magic. We'll skip Divine Magic because it's not that relevant, but Favored by the Gods gives us 2d4 we can roll once per rest as a second chance, whenever we fail a saving throw or miss on an attack roll. Second level Sorcerers unlock their Font of Magic, which is basically a pool of sorcery points that we can use to transform into spell slots or enhance our spells via meta magic, which we'll get into next level. Basically, you can choose to use these to give you more smite slots or your turn your thunder damage into cold damage. I could honestly see people going either way here, but have fun with it. We're gonna be skipping level four sorcerer since we covered the ability score improvements already, so level three sorcerer is gonna be our final level where we'll discuss meta magic, which we introduced last level. We're gonna cover the transmuted spell meta magic option. It gives you a list of spell damage types. Acid, Cold, Fire, Lightning, Poison, and Thunder. You can spend one sorcery point, which is honestly very low cost, and change a spell of one damage type on this list to another. This is how we'll convert Thunderous Smite to cold damage for our E, Permafrost. Alright, now that we've completed the build, let's see how we did. First the good. We got Bristle. Sejuani is also super tanky and can hold down the fort with various crowd control abilities. This build can also do a surprising amount of damage thanks to our Sorkadin vibes. Now the bad. The main issues with this build are because of 5e's lack of ice magic or things we can do with transmuted spell. Having to use hold person instead of an ice tomb spell, check out our Freljord homebrew for that, is pretty depressing, but it still technically works. The only other issue is your DM may not give you a giant boar and instead you'll have to use a rhinoceros as bristle. So what'd you think? I've included a link to this build via D&D Beyond in the description below, as well as Amazon links to the books used in this build. If you enjoy this type of content, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We have a few awesome rewards, including access to our Discord community and monthly homebrew releases. We plan on churning out one League Champion build every week. Thanks for watching, and hopefully we'll catch you on the Rift, or in the Forgotten Realms.